Okay, let me see, let me see. And it looks like it works, which is perfect. Great. Then I don't need to worry about that anymore. And I only need to worry about you guys here. As everyone can hear me, uh, let's do. Uh, yes, I see. I see people with cameras nodding, which is great. Yes. So good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Victoria. Uh, Victoria Karjova from 15 by 4 Munich and I am in Munich uh, right now so I will be referring to the Munich time mostly but I hope we can come to an understanding <laughs> whenever I talk about time so for us it's now 6 in the evening 6 p.m uh, in other parts where people are joining from it might be 7 or 8 and we are here today on the very experimental very first ever international uh, 15 by 4 event. I hope it will be enjoyable and fun. Uh, I hope you will learn a lot of new things and we'll also have a chance to interact with uh, people, uh, meet other people who are interested in 15 by 4, 15 by 4 community from around the world. And please be forgiving to us if some things don't go exactly as planned or if there's something that is a bit delayed because we are, as I said, experimenting today, doing something uh, and using this platform for the very first time. Uh, we try to find a solution which will provide both a chance for us to hear lectures in an organized way, but at the same time to have a space for interaction. So there is a lot of things going on. Uh, we hope we manage, <laughs> but please yeah, be ready that some things might not work straight away and be persistent, they will eventually work. Uh, the platform we're using today is NIT, and its uh, special feature is that uh, here you can not only listen to lectures, it's not like just Zoom, but also you can do a lot of interactivity. And I think uh, we will use the time for uh, introduction also to play a bit with this and figure out how it works. So I see that many of you already discovered there is a chat, which is great. If you haven't, check it out right now. It's in the uh, left bottom corner. Uh, please send us an emoji if you found it. Um, maybe write us where are you joining us from. Uh, very interesting to see who are the guests of tonight. Yay, Lily is in Munich, <laughs> which I kind of knew, but uh, yeah, Monib is here, cool. I'm uh, happy to see more people from Munich. Uh -huh. Oh, wow, Poland, uh, Ukraine, Kharkiv, Ternopil, uh, Kiev, also Ukraine, great. Great, great, great. Well, I'm especially happy that we already have people from Kharkiv here because of course, Kharkiv is the birthplace of 15 by four. And I guess many of you know this pretty well, but I will still give a short introduction what 15 by four is and what is expecting uh, of us today. We are doing live stream. So one live stream has already started, uh, which shows what I'm presenting right now. There will be a second live stream, which will be for, and this live stream will also be for Nobel prizes. There will be a second live stream for Ig Nobel prizes. And I am going to, uh, send you links in the chat uh, in a second, which you are welcome to share with your friends. Please invite people who could not join us to, tonight in NIT to watch the live stream there. And uh, let me find the links. Here they are. And of course, by these links, it will be possible to access the recordings later on as well. Oh, yeah, both links work. That's good. Yay, so nice to see people from everywhere. That's really good. I am also very happy that you figured how the chat works and where it is located. So that's that's the first step. Uh, tonight, uh, this is our timeline in Munich or Berlin time. Uh, we are starting now at 6. At 6.15, we will start with the lectures. Uh, we will have two parallel sessions, please. Don't be confused. We have two parallel sessions. They will go at the same time. I know maybe you want to hear all the talks, but then part of them you will have to listen in, in the recording. Uh, one 
part will be dedicated to Nobel Prizes, or actually we'll have one uh, lecture about history of Nobel Prizes and three lectures about Nobel Prize of 2020. The other session will be about Ig Nobel Prizes of 2020. Uh, as in a traditional 15 by 4 format, we will have four lectures of 15 minutes in each of these sessions. And each of them will be followed by uh, Q&A. Q&A will be around five minutes. Uh, we don't want to uh, make it too long that everyone gets too tired, but and be sure to stay afterwards because we will have networking in lounges. I think many of you have already had a look at our main page, which is called Hub. And in the Hub, there are two lounges, the Speakers Lounge and the 15 by 4 Lounge, and you're invited to join one of these lounges later. In the Speakers Lounge, we will have all the speakers, and you can find them and ask more questions about their talks, generally about their and a professional life and anything else. In 15 by 4 Lounge, we invite you to talk about 15 by 4 around the world, meet uh, people from other places where 15 by 4 is run, exchange experiences, chat, and get to know each other. So please stay for networking part for sure. Uh, and what 15 by 4 is? So 15 by 4 is sharing knowledge, and we think that knowledge sharing is not something that has to be limited to um, school or university or any like very specialized organization. We think that everyone uh, who has the knowledge should be able to share it. And we are sharing knowledge for people, so for everyone and by people. And our speakers are often scientists, but not always. And we are open to everyone who has the knowledge and passion and interest to prepare a good lecture, to come on stage and to talk to the guests and share what they know. 15 by 4 appeared uh, in 2015, so it's it's been five years, which I find quite impressive. Uh, in Munich, we exist for uh, over three years now, so since 2017. And uh, 15 by 4 is a growing international community. We have over 20 cities across Europe and South Asia. Uh, we have uh, existence in, I think, seven countries at least. Uh, I should have double checked before this, but I unfortunately didn't. And even though the uh, uh, pandemic put a lot of stress on everything which was connected to the events, and 15 by 4 is also has gone through difficult times, we, as you see, we're still uh, doing everything we can. And I think uh, with the problems also new possibilities appeared, and this brought us to do this international event together, bringing together people from uh, different 15 by 4 branches. So tonight we have uh, speakers from not only Munich, <laughs> which I am also from, but also from Ternopil in Ukraine, uh, from Kyiv and Dresden. We have a speaker who is uh, associated with the Kyiv branch, but currently lives in Dresden. Uh, we have um, speaker from Krakow, we have a speaker from Rostov on Don in Russia, uh, and we have speaker from uh, Haifa in Israel. Uh, did I forget anyone? And from Kharkiv as well, we have a speaker. Um, and also more people from other branches helped us to prepare, and so more branches participated in creating this event, in putting it together and advertising, uh, and I think this I hope this is the one, the first one in the row of more collaborative activities that 15 by 4 International will do. And these are uh, some of the important values that we adhere to. Um, sharing knowledge is, of course, important, but also we do care that the knowledge is accessible uh, for everyone. We really take care that all our lectures are based on facts, that's factfulness, and we also try to engage the community and build a community around this knowledge sharing. And that's why today we don't only have lectures, but we have this networking part where you will meet other people from the community. And this is uh, something we have started doing recently in Munich. Uh, it's a random copy uh, where I can also share your chat. If you want to, after this event, be in touch and meet more people from other uh, 15 by 4 places and want to meet people in Munich, you are very much invited 
uh, my my link is weird. Let me do it again. Uh, to join this, this is a Telegram bot which allows you to meet other people uh, in 15 by 4 community. Okay, this was a lot of introduction. And bef now, before we go into the lectures, I want you to play a bit uh, with this neat platform and get to know it a bit more. Okay, I want to stop sharing. And <laughs> I think it worked. Great, so we are now on the stage. And you see there are only some people who have videos on, and these are speakers and moderators. Uh, later on, we will go into separate stages. One will be here uh, for Nobel Prize, another will be in the, another room, uh, which is called Ig Nobel uh, uh, Lectures. To get there, you need to go back to the event hub and enter the Ig Nobel Lecture part. For this, you find on the left the button called Event and uh, you press hub then you will go to the hub this is just one of the and there, from there you can enter the stage or you can enter the networking launches you can also network in small groups wherever you are and for example now we are in this hall for Nobel prizes you can create your small circle to interact with other people who join your circle and i know that there were some guests who joined a bit early and they already tried so maybe i asked um, Boris, if you would be so kind to create a new circle and we will see how it works. And if you yourself want to create a new circle, you go on the left side, you press menu and say new circle. And this is what Boris did right now. Uh -huh, very good. And Nina also created one and you can now join one of these circles or you can create your own. So either just press on Boris circle, for example, and join there or press menu, new circle, and create a new one. And you can easily go between the circles and uh, see who joins there and meet them and talk. <laughs> and someone maybe joins uh, Boris. Okay, now he joined the other circle, okay. Cool, this is how some of the networking works in this uh, platform. When the circle gets too big to you, feel free to create a new one. And you can also message anyone privately uh, from the guests and invite them to talk to you privately. Now let's uh, start getting back and splitting into two sessions. So here, uh, please all the speakers for Nobel Prize sessions stay. Uh, I will be a moderator, so I should also stay here. And the uh, speakers and the moderator for the session for Ig Nobel Prize, please go to the Ig Nobel Prize stage. Please remember to enter through the special link that you know, so that you have all the uh, rights you need to share your screen and do a presentation. And in a couple minutes, we will start. Okay. Let me just shortly check this small circle which is hanging out there. Okay, I hope I am still properly working. Uh, let me double check the stream because then I realized that the stream might, the stream seems to work fine. And let me check what is happening in the other, in the other room.
Okay. So meanwhile, shall we do another check of uh, who are you join where are you joining guys from? Uh, I know that some of you already wrote, but I, I see now there are more people. Please write where, where are you joining us from? Maybe how you found out about this event? Uh, have you been to 15 by 4 before in other places, in other cities, online? Anyhow, and I'm just checking the technical setup and checking if the other room is working fine. Okay, let me see. Munich, ah, Macedonia and Turkey, cool. Online, okay. We don't have 15 by four in Turkey yet, but I think we should. Why don't we do it yet? We should have one. Cool, cool, cool. So uh, since there are some new people, I will uh, repeat a little bit of my introduction just to make sure that we are all on the same page. Uh, and you guys know what is going to happen. Uh, Helsinki, cool, Kharkiv, great, super nice. Thank you all for coming today. I hope this will be fun. And let me, so this is what is expecting us. We have done a little bit of ready, can check this off our list. Uh, we've done the about 15 by four part. Uh, we are now going to, in the talks on Nobel Prizes. So in this room, stay for Nobel Prizes. If you want to hear about Ig Nobel Prizes, please go back to the hub. Uh, for this, you need to press button event and hub and then join the Ig Nobel part. We will have in each of the sessions four talks of 15 minutes. Uh, each of talks will be followed by a short Q&A around five minutes. And then please don't completely leave. Uh, go to the hub and join one of the networking lounges, speakers lounge or 15 by four lounge to talk more. I am Victoria and this is 15 by four. Uh, 15 by four is an international community of science communication events uh, where we share knowledge for people by people. It exists already for five years, was born originally in Kharkiv in Ukraine and then spread to other countries starting from Russia, Moldova, um, and yeah, Estonia. So we're often Russian speaking people brought it to the country, but right now several of our branches are in English. Well, some are in Russian and Ukrainian, but others are in English. Like I am from 15 by four Munich and we are English speaking branch, which exists for over two years, uh, three years right now. And overall we have over 20 cities in seven countries around Europe and South Asia. And we are very happy that um you came to, to today to this first ever international 15 by 4 event and pretty experimental one so please be patient and be kind to us if something doesn't work straight away but we will make sure that it does eventually work and that you enjoy the event with this i will stop sharing my screen uh, screen and tell us let's talk about the nobel prizes so our first talk of tonight uh, will be not about the Nobel Prize that was given this year, but about the history of Nobel Prizes. We thought it's very interesting and important to understand how the Nobel Prizes appear and how they are awarded so that we can also better understand why certain uh, certain um, discoveries were awarded with the Nobel Prize. And this uh, talk will be presented by Lily. Uh, Lily is one of 15 by 4 Munich members uh, as well. Uh, she is also our regular speaker. She has given many interesting lectures. Definitely check our YouTube for more lectures of her. And uh, she is a neuroscientist doing a pure PhD in neuroscience and is a very good speaker to talk about many different uh, topics in the biomedical field. And uh, today she will talk about the history of Nobel Prizes. Please, Lily, welcome on stage and start sharing your screen. Hello, everyone. Um, so today I will be talking about the Nobel Prizes. Uh, I will actually be talking about the history of Nobel Prizes and uh, why there are some controversies about Nobel Prizes. So uh, can you guys see my... <laughs> I, I think I am not visible anymore. 
so then I am not as alone. <laughs> so um, whenever a Nobel Prize is awarded every year, it actually happens that as soon as the announcement comes out about who won the Nobel Prize, there will be an article in a scientific journal or even sometimes in normal uh, news media, and they will be talking about why this Nobel Prize and was given to the wrong person, or what is the problem with this Nobel Prize. And there is a reason why this controversy happens, and it is interesting that these controversies actually happen mostly within the scientific field. So today I'll be talking about how these Nobel Prizes came about, and why do scientists have so many issues with the Nobel Prizes. So we will start by the actual Nobel Prizes. So there are uh, six Nobel Prizes. We have the Nobel Prizes in Physics, Chemistry, physiology or medicine. We also have literature, peace, and the Nobel Prize of Economical Sciences. This last one was added later. It's not part of the five ones that Alfred Nobel himself had the idea for. Actually, the Economical Sciences Nobel Prize was created in 1968, and the full name of this prize is actually the Bank of Sweden Prize in Economic Sciences in Memory of Alfred Nobel. Today, for this talk, I'll be focusing a lot more on the three uh, science Nobel Prizes. And uh, to just start this talk, we'll be talking a little bit more about Alfred Nobel, the person that invented or had the idea for this Nobel Prize. So Alfred Nobel, he was born in 1833 and he was born in Sweden. He wanted to be a poet, but his father uh, thought he would not make any money out of being a poet and forced him to become a chemical uh, engineer and to join the family business of producing nitroglycerin, which is a very uh, a powerful explosive and not very stable. Then in 64, his factory that produced nitroglycerin exploded and his brother died. This made him start uh, playing with nitroglycerin and trying to devise a way to make uh, explosives more safe to handle. And so in 1867, he invented dynamite and he made millions out of this. Dynamite is a very stable explosive, so it was much easier to create and to handle. Then in 1888, Alfred's uh, brothers died. Now, this is important because when uh, Alfred's brother died, a French newspaper uh, mistake both brothers and they wrote uh, an obituary to Alfred Nobel thinking that he had died and there they wrote that the merchant of debt has died. Alfred Nobel died, uh, the person that got rich by inventing new and faster ways to kill people. When Alfred Nobel read this piece of article in the newspaper he got very shocked that people saw him as a person that invented new ways of, to make people die and so uh, people nowadays believe that this was the reason why he created the Nobel Prizes. Alfred Nobel died in 96 of a stroke without any family, uh, wife or children. So at this point, he wrote a testament where he said that about 150 million uh, um, euros of his money in today's uh, coin, he would live it he would leave this money to create these prizes that he did not tell anyone about. In his testament, he specifically wrote that all of his money, 94% of his money, should be uh, stored and should be uh, awarded to every year to the people that have made the greatest benefit to mankind. He further described that this uh, money should be divided into five prizes to the fields of physics, chemistry, physiology or medicine, literature, and peace. He also said that there should be certain institutions that would decide who gets the prizes. And furthermore, he specifically said that this specific prize should be given to anyone, no matter their nationality. So within his testament, Alfred Nobel actually described what he aimed for this and what these Nobel Prizes should be but he never told anyone about this. So when this testament came out and there was so much money to be given to something that he never told anyone that he was gonna do, no one really knew what to do about it. So only in 1901 was the first Nobel Prizes given and 
The Nobel Prize of Physics was awarded to Willem Konrad Rutgen, a German a physicist for the discovery of X-rays. Then uh, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for Jakobus Hoff for the description of osmotic pressure, which is uh, something that we still use today for filtration systems. Then we have Emil von Behring, the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for serum therapy. Uh, he basically discovered that we can make uh, antibodies from and transfer them from one person to the other and they will still work. This is uh, the basis for many of our vaccines and also many of the COVID treatments that people are investigating today. Then we have Sully Proudhon, Nobel Prize in Literature, a French poet. And finally, we have Henri uh, Dunant. He received the Nobel Prize, uh, Peace Prize for the foundation of the Red Cross. Now, as you can see, all three of these uh, Nobel Prizes, all of them had a high impact, both at the time that they were awarded, but also today. All of these inventions are still in use today and they made and they have an impact in what we do and how society works. So this is actually one of the foundations of when you receive a Nobel Prize. Your discovery needs to be something that has changed not only your scientific field, but also society and will have an impact in the future. And I think these are great representations of this. Now let's talk a little bit more about who can get a Nobel Prize. So only three people can share a Nobel Prize, maximum. Then one Nobel Prize can have can be given for different discoveries. This happens quite regularly. Regularly, For example, this year's Nobel Prize in Physics was given for the discovery uh, that the black hole is a good prediction of the theory of relativity from Alfred Einstein, and also that there is a supermassive compact object in the center of our galaxy. Uh, finally, the prizes can only be given to living people uh, whether or not you have a, the political support from your country has no influence during World War, during World War Wars. Uh, there were many people that uh, got uh, selected to be given the Nobel Prize, but because they were Jews, uh, Germany wanted to refuse uh, that they should be given the Nobel Prize, and this has no impact. You will still get your Nobel Prize. The awards cannot be contested, so whether it is revealed in the future that you are actually not such a nice person, you still got the Nobel Prize and no one can uh, remove it. And not every prize has to be awarded every year. This has happened, especially during the World War Wars, but also more recently, actually, the Nobel Prize of Literature was not awarded, I believe, in 2017. Um, so these are some of the rules that we need to know about uh, who can receive a Nobel Prize. Also, the Nobel Prize selection process takes about a year. So the selection process starts about in September of the previous year, and then the Nobel Committee uh, will contact people that they believe are qualified to nominate scientists that they believe will, should receive the Nobel Prize. These are usually people that are uh, renowned scientists, other Nobel Prize winners, people that are the heads of many of international universities and colleges, and anyone else that the Nobel Committee feels like is qualified enough to send this um, um, nomination. Once the nominations are in, the Nobel Committee will uh, discuss with the experts in the field if this nomination makes sense. And then only in October of the next year will there be a vote in who should get this Nobel Prize. And finally, in December, there will be the Nobel Prize award ceremony. Uh, a Nobel Prize uh, laureate will uh, always get a little diploma with uh, a piece of art, a unique piece of art. It will also get uh, usually a small citation about what the Nobel Prize was about. They will get a gold medal and will have a prize money that will depend on the year's revenue from the Nobel Prize Foundation. This year, this is about a million euros divided by all the winners of that specific Nobel Prize. Um, some of the most iconic Nobel laureates, so people that we, everyone knows that has received a Nobel Prize, will include Marie Curie. She received both uh, the, prize, the Nobel Prize in Physics and the Nobel Prize in Chemistry, both for works in radiation. Then we have Albert Einstein received the Nobel Prize in Physics for the photoelectric effect, still used today for uh, solar panels. Then we have Alexander Fleming, 
He received the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine for the discovery of penicillin, one of the first antibiotics and still used today to treat syphilis. Then we have Max Planck. He received the Nobel Prize in Physics for uh, his discovery on quantum energy. Uh, so he's the uh, inventor of the word quantum that you hear so much these days in, in, in uh, news. Then we have um, Francis Crick, uh, James, uh, um, James Watson and Maurice Wilkins. They received the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for the description that the uh, DNA has this double helix structure. Uh, now, some of these Nobel laureates are also some of the people that we have some wrong ideas about. So many people believe that Alfred Albert, <laughs> Albert Einstein received the Nobel Prize for his theory uh, of the relativity. But actually, this is not true. At the time that he had the idea for his theory, people didn't, the scientific field did not believe that his theory made any sense. Only many years later was it proven that actually he was right. And many of today's Nobel Prize, especially in physics, are related to his uh, general theory of relativity. Another wrong idea that people have is that um, uh, Rosalind Franklin should have also received the Nobel Prize for her discovery of the uh, shape of the um, DNA helix. And it is true, she was the one that took the picture that uh, provided the clues to uh, this, the cipher or discover that the DNA has this shape. However, at the time that uh, all three of these people received their Nobel Prize in 1962, uh, Rosalind was already dead for years. So Nobel Prizes can only be given to people that are alive. So Rosalind never actually uh, was in line for the prize. Um, some other prizes that are a bit more controversial and also a little bit more recent include the Philip Sharp and Richard Roberts Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 93. So they received the prize because they described the splicing effect. This is something that happens when DNA is transformed in RNA. And this is something that completely changed the way that scientists deal with the genes, how scientists discover new diseases, and even how we work with the CRISPR-Cas system that received the Nobel Prize this year. But actually, the splicing effect that was key in the scientific field was first uh, uh, seen or observed by Louise Chow. Louise Chow, she was a student uh, in uh, um, Richard Roberts' lab, and she was the one that uh, had the, the knowledge to make this experiment. She was the one that designed the experiment, and she was the one that made the observation. Although she was never uh, awarded the Nobel Prize. Another person that many believe should have gotten the Nobel Prize includes uh, Douglas Prasher. He was the one that um, discovered uh, a gene in jellyfishes that you can see here in this picture. Jellyfishes, some jellyfishes can glow a bright green, so they are fluorescent. Douglas Prasher was able to find this gene, clone it, and make it available for everyone in the world. Every scientist that wants to have a shiny um, cell can have it thanks to Douglas Prasher. He cloned this gene, he found it, and then he suggested to his colleagues that we could probably use this fluorescent gene to uh, see what is happening inside cells. So right now we are able to both uh, make uh, animals and entire organisms shiny, but we can also make individual cells shiny, including neurons. More importantly, we can even go to the molecular level and see how certain molecules and certain proteins behave inside the cells. This is a multi-million dollar industry that we use a lot. I use this a lot in my lab, for example, for my experiments. Uh, however, uh, three other people received the Nobel Prize in 2008 for this discovery. This was such uh, a thing that actually one of the winners uh, of the Nobel Prize, one of the laureates, Martin uh, Schalfi, he said that actually Douglas should have gotten the prize. However, at the time that this Nobel Prize was awarded, Douglas had already left science. He started selling cars. He did not want to do science anymore. But then here the question is, just because you are not doing science anymore, should you still not get credit for something that you spent your time and your energy discovering? Uh, so these are some of the most recent um, controversies relating to Nobel Prizes. Um, 
but something that I wanted to think about when you think about these controversies, there are two important things. So one of these things is uh, Nobel Prizes can only be given to dead people. Uh, sorry, Nobel Prizes can only be given to alive people. Nobel Prizes are, uh, for you to get a Nobel Prize, another scientist needs to nominate you. So you need to be known in the field. Third thing, the Nobel Prizes can be given to a maximum of three people. Now, when the Nobel Prizes were first thought about uh, in the 1900s, science was a one-person job. There was one lonely scientist in the middle of a lab full of glasses, flames, and explosions, and they were the ones that made the experiments, had the idea for it, and then told the world about it. And this was possible in 1900. However, Today, science is about collaboration. And a great example here is uh, Professor Frances Ornola. She actually won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2018. And here you can see, uh, she won the Nobel Prize for Directed Evolution, but what is important in this picture is that this is all the people that were involved in uh, developing this method. And she is the lone person that received a Nobel Prize. So, the rule of three no longer applies to science. Why should the person that is the director of the lab be the only one to receive the prize? All of these people have collaborated in some way to make uh, this discovery. So this is something, this is the major factor of the controversy for Nobel Prizes in science today. And with this, there are some things that I want you to uh, take home and when you listen to the next talks to think about is that Nobel Prizes are important. Nobel Prizes, they call attention to society. They are one of the few scientific prizes that the population in general will know about. And if they hear that someone received the Nobel Prize, they will know that this person is a very, very good scientist. And this is true. People that win Nobel Prizes are hardworking scientists that have worked for years to make their discoveries and to get as successful as they are. However, I also want you to think about that the rules that we had for Nobel Prizes 100 years ago are no longer uh, able to apply to what society and what science is today. So maybe it is time to start thinking about how we could have better rules for this Nobel Prize uh, awarding. Um, but this is something that I will leave to the consideration of people that know Nobel Prizes better than me. <laughs> And I hope you like this talk and I hope you'll enjoy uh, learning about the Nobel Prizes of this year. Yay, thank you, Lily. The only drawback of online events, we cannot really upload, but we do <laughs> mentally do this. <laughs> we have now five minutes uh, for questions. Uh, and if you have a question, please uh, type it in the chat. And uh, I will read them to to Lily. I also will read questions in from the YouTube. So if you're watching us on YouTube, please feel free to type a question in the chat there and I will read it. Meanwhile, uh, Lily, I, I will start with a, a short question. Um, I remember that uh, you, you said that there was no real instructions from the Nobel how this prize should be set up. So what, how and who did decide on the rules eventually? Um, so he did not tell anyone about this. So when people opened his testament and they were reading that he was giving most of his money away to this weird thing that he wanted to do, everyone was a bit shocked. But the fact that so much money uh, was going to go to this weird thing also made people a lot interested in how this was going to develop. I mean, he was one of the millionaires of his time. So people were paying attention. So in the end, what happened is that the people that were in charge of making sure that his testament would be fulfilled, um, these were the people that then uh, put themselves to creating the Nobel Prize uh, organization. And these were the ones that put the money in. And then they contacted the people from this uh, Swedish and the uh, Norwegian academies so that they would decide who should get this prize. And this is how it, it all started. And then once people realized that the people that were being nominated uh, many years later, right? So when people were starting to look back and they saw, oh, so um, the person that invented the X-rays got this Nobel Prize. And yes, this is a very important discovery. So then 
like the next generations had to uphold this um, high expectation and high impact to society on the Nobel Prize side. So then this is how then they became more famous and people start becoming more accepting of Nobel Prizes and everyone start knowing what a Nobel Prize is. Because if you are going to receive a prize that Albert Einstein also received, you know you're, it, it must be someone that is very good. I'm not sure if Veronica, if Victoria is still there or if I am the one that has frozen because I cannot see anyone's camera. However, I'm just going to go to be a question that showed up on the chat and hope that I'm still alive. So, the, you are. <laughs> oh, okay. So I'm not the only one. Good. So I got a question from uh, Yuri. I, I am very sorry if I cannot pronounce all of your names correctly. I'm very sorry. So the Peace Prize has been awarded to organizations many times. Yes, actually, this is true. The Peace Prize is uh, is the only prize that is given to institutions, and usually to only one institution. And but this is the only one. All the other ones are always three prizes. So yes, the rules are respected. The Nobel Prize is the only special one. Then I have a question from Chen Ling. How the Nobel Prizes Foundation keeps making money through investment? What happens if they made a failed investment? So the Nobel Prize money that it's given every year, it's not a set amount of money. It will change every year depending how much money the foundation has made through its investments. I don't know uh, very well what investments the, the foundation makes. I am, I'm, don't know for sure, but I do know that depending on how many money comes back from those invest, investments that year, they will get more money. So if you look up how much money has been given throughout the years, you will see that every year the amount of money is different. For example, during World Wars, there was uh, like the, the economy was in chaos, so that was less money. So this is what happens. Also, if you deny a Nobel Prize, if you say, oh, I don't want this Nobel Prize, then that you will still get the Nobel Prize because the Nobel Prize cannot be contested. But that money will revert back to the foundation. I Am I back, by the way? You are back. You Yay. <laughs> so we have very li little time left, but I think there are two questions which can be put together. One is, can the Nobel Prize rules be changed? And another one is connected. There was a lot of our argument about the chemistry Nobel Prize recently because it is often awarded not for chemistry, but rather biology or medicine in this direction. Does it maybe make sense to create a new Nobel Prize, like biomedicine Nobel Prize instead? And is it possible at all? Okay, so to the rules for the rules to change, I mean, the rules have changed before. So this three people rule and the no dead people rule, all of these rules were created after the, the first Nobel Prizes were awarded. So these were some rules that the, the, the different um, scientific academies developed to try to figure out how and who should get these prizes. But the thing is that in the recent years, there has been no change in the Nobel Prize rules. And even though scientists have been claiming that these rules should, should change for the past 10 years, people have been saying that these rules should change, especially the rule of three, it has not been done. So I am not so certain how easy it is to change the rules of the Nobel Prize. Then the question about uh, creating a new field and a new Nobel Prize, yeah, easier said than done. The, the only Nobel Prize that has been created is the Nobel Prize of Economics. And this was because the, the uh, Bank of Sweden gave a lot of money to the uh, Nobel <laughs> organization. So I actually don't know how you can come about to creating another Nobel Peace Prize. I guess you would have to have some philanthropic rich person uh, that would force this. But I'm not really sure how you go about doing it. Good, got it. Thanks a lot, Lily. Uh, we would like to go on to our next presentation, but everyone who had more questions, please stay after the talks are done. Join the speaker's lounge and ask Lily more. I do think that's a very fascinating topic to discuss. What's the relevance of the Nobel Prize? Is it overrated? Is it too hyped? Should it be now given to the labs, like 
teams of the researchers rather than individual people and is there anything that society can do about this so let's talk about this afterwards with this thank you lily very much and we will now move on to our first nobel prize 2020 talk uh, which will be a uh, nobel prize in physics presented to us by yuri yuri is from ternopil uh, he is one of the most renowned speakers of today uh, because he's the head of physics department of Ternopil um, National Technical University. So very serious person, but also very fun. We already enjoyed a lot interacting with him during the preparation. And he also says that he enjoys a lot uh, teaching and interacting with his students and the fact that he can be friends with the students afterwards, after they graduate. So I hope um, this will be fun. Prepare your questions and welcome on stage, Yuri. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Hopefully you can see my screen now. Yes. And uh, hello, everyone. Uh, as Victoria said, my name is Yuri Skorenki. And in the next 15 minutes, I'm going to tell you something to share with you about Nobel Prize in Physics 2020 and also about the darkest secrets of our own galaxy and many other galaxies in the universe, believe it. Actually, it's uh, quite surprising that for the third year in a row, the Nobel Prize in Physics is awarded to people who work in the field of astronomy and general relativity. Last year, these were discoverers of exoplanets and cosmic microwave background radiation. In 2018, the prize uh, has been won by uh, gravitational wave detection uh, collaboration, uh, representatives of that collaboration, not strictly the organization, actually. Those gravitational waves have been generated by two collapsing black holes, which is in the center of, of two, this year's Nobel Prize. This year, the Nobel Committee decided to honor the theoretical contribution to our understanding of uh, black holes' nature and the uh, Nobel Prize in Physics goes to Roger Penrose, Reinhard Genzel, and Andrea Mia Guess. Well, uh, they will share not equal parts of the prize. One half goes to Sir Roger Penrose for his theoretical discoveries in the field of general relativity. Uh, so he's a mathematician, and that's uh, part of folklore. folklore why? mathematicians uh, didn't get their own Nobel Prize. We can discuss it later. And the other half of Nobel Prize will be split between uh, astronomers, Reinhard Genzel and uh, Andrea Mia Guess, who have observed uh, and have proved that there is a supermassive black hole in the very center of uh, Milky Way, of our own galaxy. I'd like to begin with the quote from German philosopher Immanuel Kant, who famously said that the uh, two most astonishing things to him are the starry sky above and the moral law inside. He would be surprised if he learned that uh, what appears to be dark in the sky actually contain, contains lots uh, and lots of stars invisible to the naked eye. And among some 10,000 stars we can see with the naked eye, uh, there are nine objects which are not stars, but galaxies, comprising hundreds of billions of individual stars, far, far away. And all the other stars belong to our own galaxy, to the Milky Way. For long, the black star, or a black hole, as we call it now, was a kind of uh, mysterious object in astronomy and it was Einstein's general relativity which gave it a correct physical explanation. And many scientists, including Einstein himself, did not believe that something like that could be described mathematically or observed directly. Actually, it cannot be observed directly. It doesn't emit anything or reflect anything. And that was British mathematician Roger Penrose, shown here to the left now and to the right when he receives his knighthood from, from uh, Queen of, uh, of Great Britain. So Penrose developed a consistent mathematical approach to, take, to tackle singularity. And singularity is at the very heart of uh, every black hole. 
So he is best known for his works on general relativity. Roger Penrose contributed to many fields, different fields of mathematics and uh, of science in general. And uh, in topology in particular, he uh, devised some of so-called impossible structures. Here uh, you can find three bar of Penrose and steps, uh, stairs of Penrose. But uh, more importantly, the piles of Penrose to the left bottom corner. Piles of Penrose is the way to fill a plane with objects of five-fold symmetry. A remarkable result in mathematics, actually. Being an influential thinker, he published lots of different books about uh, artificial intelligence and uh, re recently about uh, nature of consciousness. And he himself believes that consciousness is a quantum effect. If Stephen Hawking, shown here in this photo with uh, Roger Penrose, if Stephen Hawking uh, survived till this moment, he would surely receive his share of Nobel Prize too. Many of uh, mathematical uh, results and theorems in general relativity for which uh, we praise uh, Roger Penrose now belong uh, jointly to these two great scientists and uh, are part of a collection known as uh, Penrose Hawking Singularity Theorems. And really, these uh, names, names of Penrose and Hawking, are to be mentioned together when we think about the evolution of the universe from the Big Bang moment and the explosion from singularity, literally from nothing, from, from a mathematical point until the current epoch with uh, accelerating expansion of our university to the rightmost uh, right part of, of this slide, which gravity cannot slow down now. Well, uh, actually, everything is here in this single equation. The general relativity field equation written down by Albert Einstein in uh, 1916. This equation looks very simple at the first glance, but it relates properties of space-time to the left-hand side and matter, momentum, energy, tensor to the right-hand side. This equation uh, can be solved, actually, and the solution of Einstein equation uh, was obtained by Carl Schwarzschild uh, in 1916, a few months after the publication by Einstein. That solution described uh, extremely dense object with super powerful gravity, which uh, even light cannot escape. And enormous amount of different explanations and visualizations have been developed as black uh, holes are at the very corner. At every corner and uh, is deeply enrooted. The term is deeply enrooted in the popular culture now. We need some uh, simple explanation to construct our personal reality. And uh, it's not easy, but possible to imagine uh, a massive object as marble here in this slide, which uh, uh, deform the fabric of space-time around it. So this is how general relativity explains gravitation as the bending space-time. And uh, what is black hole then? Black hole is an object so dense that it dips through this space-time fabric and creates a gravity field crater. And that crater attracts uh, all of the matter and all of the light from the surrounding uh, space. I should also mention Robert Oppenheimer and Hartland Snyder, uh, who were the first to discuss visibility of describing physical world with such a mathematical abstraction as a singularity. And the term black hole was coined by Robert Dicke and John Archibald Wheeler, and Wheeler, who first opposed the idea later popularized it very much. A black hole for long was kind of hypothetical object, not available for studies. Here is the uh, Nobel winning paper by Penrose, which dates back to uh, 1965. And in this paper, three pages actually, 
uh, an explanation has been given of uh, what we can expect when we uh, approach that black hole from outside and when we cross the, that event horizon, the radius, uh, the sphere of uh, radius uh, known as Schwarzschild radius. So, uh, in short, the paper by uh, Penrose states that when we cross the event horizon, then sense of space and time changes. Space coordinates became time-like. So this uh, light cone to the left, changes, so to say, changes is its direction. We don't see the space at all. We just continue moving towards the singularity, which, as was proven by Penrose, is in the heart of every of every kind of black hole. So that was a groundbreaking discovery. And uh, actually, there are lots of different videos and visualization in YouTube to show us what kind of views, what kind of gravitational lensing we'll see when we approach the uh, event horizon and mostly do the room. Probably the most accurate depiction of the call is this poster by the from Interstellar movie by Christopher Nolan. And Nolan was advised to the man uh, in the rightmost uh, photo here, uh, Kip Thorne, uh, who received the prize last year. And uh, well, if I mention gravitational wave, I have to mention LIGO collaboration as well. LIGO stands for Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, and it uh, consists of uh, two uh, interferometers in uh, Livingstone and uh, Hanford. In 2017, the merger of two black holes was detected as the chirp in space-time fabric. Uh, so, till now, gravitational astronomy produced lots of different results. Many more measures have been observed. So, uh, there's a general opinion that gravitational wave astronomy has potential to augment the optical astronomy. And uh, uh, probably you also heard about uh, this picture of black hole, which is depiction, actually, the reconstruction in the, uh, of the black hole in the center of galaxy M87 presented uh, to public in uh, uh, 2019. And uh, how do supermassive black holes come into existence? Currently, uh, there is no explanation for this part, for such a supermassive black holes containing so much of energy and uh, no one questions the existence of black hole in the universe themselves. Uh, and uh, to have such a, to explain the existence of such a heavy black hole, we would wait for too long time or we would observe something, we have to observe something. And this is what uh, German uh, astronomer Reinhard Genzel and American astronomer Andrea Mia Guess did. Uh, they uh, let two different groups. Uh, those groups continued observation uh, with the largest available telescopes for more than 30 years, and they traced stars in the vicinity of Sagittarius A asterisk, uh, object which is at the center of Milky Way. And before uh, their proof, two possibilities were discussed. One, uh, that there is a just a cluster of uh, ordinary stars, which we cannot see because of dust. Uh, gal galaxy center is covered with dense dust, opaque for visible light. And the second uh, possibility was that there is compact object, which must be a black hole. So both groups used radio astronomy devices. Uh, for gas, used this uh, trick uh, as early as in uh, 2000, in year 2000, so they observed very interesting results. They traced orbits of the stars, and one of those stars, uh, denoted here SO2, has the shortest period of just 16 years. So by now, two periods were observed, and it was proven with very high accuracy that the central object there must be compact, supermassive, black hole. 
Well, uh, I'd reiterate that there is no explanation currently. How those are formed? And there are many more questions. The question of dark energy, for example, which pushes those galaxies out, and uh, its uh, nature is uh, covered with, with mysteries. But I believe that in years to come, we'll see lots of many new developments and new discoveries. And thank you for your attention. It was my pleasure to share it with you. Maybe you have questions. I'd be happy to answer or not. Great. Thank you very much, Yuri. Uh, yes, we are accepting questions now in the chat. Please write them wherever you have the chat. If you're on YouTube, write on YouTube. If you are with us in need, please write there. And I see some applause in the chat. Thank you. Let me see. Uh, OK, there are more applause. Um, Yuri, maybe let's first hear your personal opinion. Do you think this uh, was a appropriate Nobel Prize that it should have given, or it was maybe something um, better that we should have received the prize this year? Well, see, every Nobel Prize is appropriate, and uh, that is awarded from the private money. Actually, it is not the only prize of this kind. Uh, I don't remember exactly how the prize uh, of one Asian philanthropist is, is uh, called, but there are analogs, not, not so much famous as Nobel Prize. And really, uh, when the Nobel Prize, uh, well, some people think it is awarded to the right guys. Other people argue. In any way, it raises awareness of science. So that's the, mm. the role, not the money themselves, not the fame, but the public awareness of science. That's the most important. So true. Thanks. OK, let me see. There is no question in the chat yet. Well, the topic is definitely pretty difficult. Uh, with um, uh, with the black holes and everything. Well, if if I may add one more comment, so sure. really science and knowledge must be uh, uh, available to everyone, but uh, that access is not effortless. See, hmm. it requires some effort. Hmm. That's true. So maybe what would be your recommendation if someone wants to understand better the physics behind Nobel, uh, sorry, black holes? Uh, do you recommend a certain book to read? Maybe something a bit more popular to understand first is the book from um, Richard Feynman, maybe something that you would recommend? Well, oh, Richard famous, Feynman oh, uh, is a fabulous author. And uh, uh, I will recommend every book from Richard Feynman, books from Hawking, which are mm -hmm. very popular and very deep in their uh, meaning, and, and also some of books by Penrose, but actually not all of them. Those uh, which concern the problem of consciousness as a quantum effect are a bit, well, for me, uh, not, not what I would expect from quantum scientists. Mm -hmm. And he is uh, a mathematician, actually, so, so that's okay. But uh, you may start from some, from some uh, channels, like 15 by 4, for example, and uh, learn from uh, renowned scientists who do the science in this field, who, who contributed themselves to current understanding. And now, uh, well, thanks to the technology, we have... Uh, easy access to any uh, celebrity from field of science. And I can see another another um, question. Yeah. May, may I answer a question from, from this chat? Sure. Well, uh, if uh, Liliana asks, if you have this black hole in the center of the galaxy, are we all going to slowly suck in? Actually, no, we are too far away. We are rotating around the center of galaxy so uh, actually one or one period of rotation for the solar system is about 20 uh, 200 not 20 but 200 million years so you can compare to the 16 years for that closest star and still that star is quite far away from the event horizon so it is completely safe too we will never be sucked into the our own center of galaxy but there, there are other galaxies moving around, and in a few billion years, there will be a measure of 
have a galaxy with uh, one of the billion clusters. So if you plan to live more than five billion years, well, then you have to reconsider um, and uh, that question in, in a few billion years again. Mm -hmm. And question is, where is the most massive black hole in the known universe? Well, I don't know, actually, but I believe that this the, is a searchable question. And uh, every day they uh, discover some new active galactic nucleus. And uh, we surely know that the uh, most massive objects are there in galactic nucleus. We cannot explain how did they evolve, because see, if during that let let me go back to to this well slide so black hole is uh, so to be result of explosion and then collapse uh, starting with blue supergiant and type uh, two supernova but if those black holes are less in mass than the uh, initial star we will need millions of such black holes to collide which is quite uh, well extraordinary event. So that's a mystery here. And do we know yeah, we something have time eventually? Maybe for one more question. Yes, um, and that is the one question which I uh, I like very much because mm -hmm. it will allow me to uh, mention uh, Rod, uh, not just Roger Penrose but Stephen Hawking once more. Can anything escape a black hole? Really? Uh, radiation and even matter, but not from inside the black hole. If something crosses the event horizon, forget about that. There will be no more radiation or uh, matter coming from inside. But if pair of particle and antiparticle is created above the horizon, then one partner will move toward us probably, and that particle will escape the gravity field. The other partner will fall down. So thank you very much. I'll be in the lobby uh, and probably we'll have more time to discuss uh, these uh, astonishing results after the party. Great. Thank you. thank you very much, Yuri. I see there are more questions that people want to ask, but please, I urge you to then approach Yuri afterwards and discuss more. Uh, Yuri, if you could stop sharing your screen, that would be great, I think. Thanks a lot. And we are now um, getting ready for our next talk. We will talk about the Nobel Prize in chemistry, which you can argue it wasn't chemistry, uh, as happened in several years in a row already. And this uh, Nobel Prize will be presented by Antonis. Uh, Antonis is a postdoctoral researcher also here in Munich, in Helmholtz Center Munich. Uh, he studies uh, microbiomes. Is it correct? I think I, I am correct, right? Uh, and he knows the topic of today's presentation not only because he read scientific books about that, but also because he practiced and used this tool, namely CRISPR-Cas, in his own uh, practical work in the lab. But today he will uh, tell you also more of theoretical basis behind that and what it is and why was it important and why it was given a Nobel Prize. Antonis, welcome on the stage. Thank you for the nice introduction. I have to say I haven't really practiced the, the method myself. But uh, no, you told me you did. Oh no. <laughs> I, I, I just I have a project about studying the call it's more studying the natural system, but anyway, we'll go more into detail during the presentation. Okay. Um, okay. Thanks and welcome everyone to my um, presentation. I will start. Just let me know if you can see uh, my presentation. No. Uh, yes. I we think I PowerPoint. Did. Let me. Okay, this one. Yes, perfect. Now we Great. see the presentation. Yes. Um, can you also see my myself? You can turn on the video. Uh, go on the bottom and say yes. Now we see you as okay, well. Great. Uh, so welcome everyone to my talk. 
um, it's my turn to talk to you now about the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for 2020, which was awarded for the development of a method for genome editing to Professor Emmanuel Sarpentier, currently working at the Max Planck Unit for the Science of Pathogens in, Ger in Germany, and Professor Jennifer Doudna, working at the University of California in Berkeley, USA. And before we try to understand why these two scientists were chosen for the Nobel Prize in Chemistry this year, let's start a bit with more basic, discussing about DNA and what is genome editing itself. So all human organisms have the information that shapes the way they look in a molecule which is called DNA and looks a little bit like, as you can see in the screen on the left. And um, DNA has, for example, information about the color of our eyes, the length of the of their hairs, or the shape of their leaves. And the genome is the total of the DNA per organism and all the information it has. Um, and each individual information is actually stored in the smallest unit of the genome, which are the, the different genes. For scientists, it's very important to study genomes and genes because we can understand why different organisms have specific abilities or why do they, they look the way they do. The information that is stored in the genome is actually inherited, which means that it passes from one generation to the next one. That's why, for example, we look like our parents, because the information that we have in our genomes is actually coming from them. And of course, our characteristics um, depend on them. Uh, in general, most of the information that we have in our genome, the organisms have in their genomes throughout their lives, is act actually remains the same. It doesn't change. But scientists thought maybe it would be possible to change the information that is stored in the genome of one organism without going from one generation to the other, but changing the genome of the of the of this organism. And of course, what we need to know first is what the information that is stored in the genome of the organism. And once we make a specific change, we can change the way they look or the abilities. And of course, a different change we got will cause different changes in the organisms, right? Um, all these techniques are the techniques that we actually call genome editing, changing the genome of the organisms. Um, for example, that would be useful because we try to treat some human diseases or because we want to give organism specific uh, characteristics, as we will see also later. And genome editing is something that is not something new. Scientists have already developed different methods to already from the previous century to change the genome of the organisms. Um, and uh, of course, like every method, these methods are not perfect either. There is a constant need that we uh, we improve the current existing techniques or we, we discover new ones. And that's actually exactly what the two awarded scientists did. They developed a new method for genome editing, which we call CRISPR-Cas2. And um, the funny, it's, it's interesting and it's kind of funny because the two scientists were not trying to develop a new method for genome editing, but they were rather, rather studying bacteria and viruses, and in particular, the way they fight each other. When they, um, they were actually um, investigating one specific system of bacteria, defensive system of bacteria, and they had the idea that maybe they can use the system for other cells uh, in order to, to edit the genome of the other cells. So, um, in order to understand a bit how this story, how this happened, let's go a bit more into detail. And starting with bacteria, these are very small organisms that we can find everywhere. They consist of only one cell. Um, they're very small and they have their own genome. And viruses are also very small. We can also find everywhere. They're actually smaller than bacteria and they have their own genome. Um, what is interesting is that viruses can attack bacteria in, a, in an interesting way. How do they do it? First, they attach on the bacterium. Then they insert their genome into the bacterium and actually into the genome of the bacterium. And when this happens afterwards, 
anti specific condition, this can cause bacteria to malfunction and eventually can lead them to death. So, clearly, viruses are a very big threat for bacteria, but bacteria have also developed mechanisms to counterattack. And one of them is the CRISPR Cas system. It's, let's go a bit more into detail, a bit deeper into the bacterium, actually. So, bacteria have a special part of their genome, which is called the CRISPR Cas. And it's quite unique because when the bacterium is exposed to different viruses and survives the attack, then it can take a small part of the genome from the viruses, incorporate it into the CRISPR-Cas system, and keep it there as a memory. So it's like an internal database for the bacterium to remember how the viral genome looks like. And next time the bacterium is exposed to the same viruses, and the viruses insert their genome into the genome of the bacterium, then CRISPR-Cas system, actually the bacterium, can use the information stored in the CRISPR-Cas system, find the viral genomes into their own genome, then it makes a cut with the CRISPR-Cas system, the natural repairing system of the bacterium will try to repair the cut, but during this process, it will add some extra information and it will uh, change the information that the viral genome has. And eventually it will make it useless. So what the important thing to keep here is that the CRISPR-Cas system has the ability to identify some spe specific information in the genome and make a cut. That's also what the two scientists saw. And they thought maybe it would be uh, possible that we use it for a different purpose this time in different cells. Um, but of course, now we want to find the specific information that we're interested in. And uh, in this case, we provide the information that we want to find with a guide molecule. So this molecule finds the information in the genome of the cell. Then the CRISPR-Cas system, which we also provide, makes a cut. The repairing system of the, of the cell will try to repair it and introduce some extra information, which will make the information useless. That's what the scientists did, and it actually worked quite successfully. So one step further, they thought if we now have the same information and we add some new information that we want to add to the system, again, the same, the guide molecule will find the information that we want, the CRISPR-Cas system will make a cut. The repairing system will try to repair the, the cut, but this time it will do it in a different way and it will use the information that we added um, externally. And during this process, it will, of course, discard again the old information by incorporating the new information into the genome. So now we have a new system for removing some information from genomes, uh, making cha make changes, or even add new information that we want. And as I said before, this is not the first time, uh, this is not the first technique that we have for genome editing. Um, so why this is the special tool is so important in this case? Um, the reason is that this system compared to the older techniques have spe some, some specific advantages. And the advantages are mostly due to the guide RNA. The special thing is that the nature of this guide RNA is very, very similar to the DNA which, which the genome consists of. So that makes the guide uh, molecule very promising for finding the exact information that we want with very high precision. But also it's very easy for scientists to construct uh, the, the molecule and, the, and of course also the, the crispr cas system in the lab which makes the whole process faster compared to the older techniques and also cheaper. That means that the, the, the new technique can now be used for many different applications, right? There are less restrictions than before. Um, and this is true. Scientists have already started using the, the, this, this system, this tool, uh, for, for several applications. Uh, some that I will mention, for example, they use it to study specific genes because in general, it's quite common whenever we, we the scientists actually discover one new gene and we don't know exactly what's the role for the, for the organism, we use the CRISPR-Cas system to remove the gene and we observe what, what changes happen in the organism so we have an idea about its role. 
Another application is to improve uh, specific plants, crops. Um, for example, um, we, um, they, they cannot survive in many cases due to pests or they cannot survive harsh environmental conditions. And by using CRISPR-Cas system, scientists made changes that enhance the resistance of the crops to this pest and also to these uh, extreme conditions. And last, we use it for pest control, meaning that whenever uh, we can actually uh, use it on pests that have the ability to carry diseases and making specific changes in their genome, in their genome we can reduce their ability to carry the disease and of course, eventually spread it into the human population. But like I said before, ah, excuse me, um, of course, these are, there are already some um, uh, studies and some applications that have been under development, but there are more and more coming uh, out and tested all the time. Um, for example, it is a very promising tool to be used for cancer, uh, alternative new cancer therapies and also for treating human genetic diseases. These are um, diseases that we know they're caused by small mistakes in the genome of the organisms of humans, especially because we're interested in them. Um, and for example, these are um, uh, blood disorders, uh, hereditary uh, deafness, and also inherited blindness. These are already some examples where scientists are trying to apply the CRISPR-Cas uh, tool in order to provide uh, solutions and, and cure the diseases. And let's keep the, the blindness exam as an example. Let's go a bit deeper. Scientists have already tried um, to treat patients that have uh, no vision by um, supplying the, the in single drops inside the eyes of the patients the CRISPR-Cas system. And in this case, the system can find the, the exact information we want to change in the cells inside the eye. And then the patients have shown that they can actually start seeing some, some, some pictures, right? Have, have a better vision than before. So these are all under development and it has a very great potential for even more applications that are uh, uh, tested all the time. But of course, I mentioned again, like every technique, CRISPR-Cas tool is not perfect. And uh, many times we use the CRISPR-Cas tool in order to treat some specific disease or what, that's what we try to do. And once the CRISPR-Cas system finds the exact information we want to change and makes a cut, makes the change, then we can cure the disease. But if the CRISPR-Cas system finds some similar information in the same genome, it might also make a cut there as well. And this can lead to unwanted, unwanted changes in the organism. So actually, there is a lot of research going on right now, how to make sure that there are no side effects and how to make sure that when we use the CRISPR-Cas tool, uh, we, do not, uh, we do not change, we, don't, we do not make unwanted changes in humans. And before I finish my talk, I also want to mention that the Nobel Prize in Chemistry this year is a very special prize for two extra reasons. The first, is that it shows really the impact of women in science in a very nice way. Because as you can see also um, in, the, in the graph, we are in general in a world where um, women are underrepresented in science and also in the Nobel Prizes. You can see with the red line that men in general, at least so far, um, have been um, uh, laureates for Nobel Prizes much more compared to women. And uh, finally, this shows that um, uh, women also get the recognition that they deserve for their own very significant impact to science. And the second is that the technique has actually developed really fast compared to the previous techniques. And, and this is true because the, um, the paper that the two professors uh, published was actually in 2012. That means that we are already only eight years after the development of this tool which is really, really a very short period. As you can see in the graph, in general, the age of the Nobel, um, award, the Nobel winners has a tendency to increase with the exception of no the Peace Nobel Prize. Um, that means that mainly more and more, the Nobel um, winners have to wait more 
to get the recognition they deserve about their research. So I hope with all this, you, it, it's now more clear why these two professors were chosen for the Nobel Prize in Chemistry this year. And um, you can now better understand why the, their achievement was so important and why the CRISPR-Cas2 tool can actually revo revolutionize um, the, the world of genome editing. So thanks for your attention. And that was the end of my presentation. Great. Thank you very have... much, Antonis. Yep. I would be happy to have questions. Sure. There are already a couple questions on YouTube. Uh, one is kind of joking. Do you think this is more chemistry or biology? Um, and the other one is, uh, do you think it would be ethical to genetically modify embryos? Can it possibly lead to eugenics 2.0 or like a new eugenics? Um, thanks for the questions. Uh, I will start with the second one. Uh, it is possible if we can change single cells, we can make changes in, in parts or at least our whole organisms. And embryos are, embryos are also small organisms. So I think scientists can um, can use it to make a lot of different changes. If we are talking about um, human embryos, there are a lot of concerns arising in this case. So to what extent uh, we should do it and uh, what kind of changes we are allowed to make. But there is a lot of discussion, of course, about this. We can discuss about this later. Um, as for the first one, um, I don't see chemistry and biology in general as two completely separate fields. They are, they are related to a very big extent. So for me, that doesn't make any change as long as it's you name it Nobel Prize Chemistry or you name it, name it Nobel Prize Biology. The most important is that this achievement actually gets the prize and the recognition. That's all. I don't know if that's a satisfying answer in this case. Yeah, I guess it's more becoming a joke that uh, in the recent years, uh, most of the chemistry prizes were given to, to biology. But then, yeah, the question is, where is the border between chemistry and biology? And maybe it's everything is just advanced mathematics, as you know, people say, like physics is advanced mathematics, and then chemistry is advanced physics, and then biology is advanced uh, chemistry or like more complex uh, chemistry. And I would also say quickly, one of the things mm -hmm. we hear sometimes is that biology is actually the chemistry of living organisms. So the base of biology is also chemistry, right? Right. But yeah, there is a question in the chat here. If we experiment enough, can we produce microorganisms who produce fuel, food, energy, etc., using CRISPR? Mm, yes, there are already actually several organisms that can produce fuel, for example, uh, without the use of CRISPR-Cas. Probably the use of the CRISPR-Cas tool would allow to introduce this ability to even different organisms. That could be, for example, something. And in this case, we could make systems that are more efficient. Uh, so yes, it would be possible. Uh, if we're talking about food, um, I think in this case, I don't know if we would use microorganisms. There are different approaches for making making food, we would use the cells of the organism that actually consists that makes the food, right? Uh, but again, yes, I think we could use CRISPR-Cas system to make the techniques more, more efficient. So for example, faster or cheaper. Hmm. Thanks. There is another question from YouTube, which I also posted in the chat mm -hmm. if you want to read it. The question is the following. following. Um, in your point of view, what can be the consequence and influence of these techniques on the natural evolution of the human organisms, especially in the field of epigenetics? Thanks. I like these questions. <laughs> I probably need some time to think about it to, to answer properly. I would say humans have challenged evolution a lot already. 
with everything we do with talent evolution, uh, CRISPR-Cas system, I think for sure is another tool that can challenge the, the evolution, the way it was happening before, right? But uh, in a way that's also evolution. Evolution brought us to this level and we now go back and then start making our own rules. Um, I cannot say much about the field of epigenetics because they are not only, to my, to my knowledge, there are not only changes in the genomes involved. Um, again, I'm sure if there is a lot of research in the field, we can find specific changes that also affect the epigenetic profile um, in organism and the way um, uh, things uh, work. Um, so, uh, th but that answers the influence, right? How, how they influence. Uh, the way we do it, uh, I guess, can be to, to a very big, big extent unpredictable. Uh, the more we use the tool from now on, the more, the more we will see how we can use it to make different changes. Because I'm sure there are limitations, but it would be interesting to see to, if we can find new ways to overcome these limitations. Um, I cannot say for sure what would be the exact consequences. I'm, I'm pretty sure we will start challenging the, the evolution more and more. That's, that's all I can say for now. But we can we can discuss about this later for for more examples mm. and more go into and more into detail. Yeah, I guess definitely this is a question that is hard to answer with a short answer, but we can yeah think about it and debate. Um, yeah. So uh, Hassan uh, comments that he enjoyed your your <laughs> the way you formulated that humans have already challenged evolution. And we a lot. Do, still do. <laughs> and definitely, and in a way, everything is evolution, right? The fact that we started mm -hmm. using CRISPR is also part of our evolution. Mm -hmm. But yeah, let's take one last question before we move okay. to our last talk. Uh, Han asks uh, that she recently saw that some people are trying to develop CRISPR-based treatments for multi-resistant bacterial infection. Uh, what is your opinion about it? Is it possible that this might become a new class of antibiotics? Uh, yes, thanks. It's a, inter another interesting question because the reason the two, like the, the first idea that the professor had uh, was actually that maybe we have, we get new antibiotics. That's why they were studying bacteria and viruses. Um, uh, definitely, I think definitely can lead to new, new class or new generation, let's say, of antibiotics. It's a very big topic right now because we, we kind of reach the limit in antibiotic production. We, we, we see that there is more and more resistant, uh, bacteria become more and more resistant to the antibiotics that we have. But on the other way, on the other side, we don't produce a lot of antibiotics. So that's, I'm pretty sure there is already, and there will be a lot of research in this field, uh, because with the CRISPR-Cas system, I mean, if we can, if it's a system of bacteria and viruses, and we already use it for for um, to work on human cells, I'm pretty sure we can use it for many different bacteria and for different viruses. Um, in in the case of antibiotics, it has to do about it's about bacteria, of course. Um, so I'm pretty sure there will be uh, a lot of new CRISPR-Cas based antibiotics soon coming out. And uh, it will be interesting to see uh, how this is going to work. I'm not sure if it has to be multi-resistant. I mean, I mean, limited to multi-resistant bacterial infections. Um, I guess that, that's, that's a good point because that's the biggest problem we have now, right now. The bacteria mm -hmm. are resistant to many different antibiotics. Um, but yes, I think that would be actually a, a very nice, one of the most important applications of the CRISPR-Cas tool uh in in the near future cool thanks a lot with this we will end this discussion for now or pause and invite everyone who wants to talk about crispr cas more to meet antonis in the speaker's lounge and ask him more and now we're moving out on to our last but not least or the final uh presentation of tonight which will be about the nobel prize in medicine or actually called physiology or medicine uh, this will be presented by Max.
Max is also one of the uh, 15 by 4 uh, members uh, with a long history. He used to live in Moscow and presented many times as 15 by 4 there. And now he moved to Israel, to Haifa, where he is a PhD student at Technion. And he is also on the way to establish a Haifa branch of 15 by 4. And uh, this is all for my introduction. Welcome on stage, Max. We are very curious to hear your presentation. Hi, thank you, Victoria. Uh, hello everyone, one second, I will share the screen and all that stuff, which every of our speakers already done. Uh, so as far as I can see, you can see my screen. Yes. Uh, one second, and probably you can even see my face. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, but not the presentation yet. Uh, now you can see the presentation, yes? Oh no. Uh, I don't see it still, no. Uh, a big black screen with hepatitis C prize on it now? No, I see our cells, like I see the need okay, in see. your browser. Mm. Very strange. So, I'm uh, stuck. Like, I'm not moving. Yeah. Uh, one second, I will stop sharing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I can t just stop the camera and now you can see the presentation, yes? Yes, PowerPoint, yes. Yes, and the presentation. Okay, if the presentation stops, uh, inform me, please. Sure, so, if you want, you can also try to start your camera again. That I, I think that the initial problem was caused by the camera, so. Uh, okay, so, like this is also fine. <laughs> Okay, so uh, yes, uh, the last talk for today. Today we will talk about uh, like what seems the least interest Nobel Prize of this year, the Hepatitis C Prize. And everyone is bored with the viruses and uh, not with coronavirus, but uh, all the other viruses. They sound quite boring. So I will explain why this Nobel Prize is really an important stuff and how it was uh, developed, like what, what happened uh, so that people got it. So the prize went to three people, the maximum amount available, uh, possible. Uh, first, the second one was Michael Houghton, and the third one was Charles M. Rice. And the uh, actual notion, like for, for what the prize was awarded, is uh, for the discovery of hepatitis virus. So uh, here we need to talk a little bit about what this virus is and where it stands in the medicine. So the hepatitis C virus is part of the group which, of viruses which are called blood-borne viral infections. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> two other viruses which are present in this group and are very important in the medicine are HIV virus, the virus which causes AIDS, and the hepatitis B virus. So those three viruses are the main players of this group, and uh, these uh, Nobel Prize, Nobel Prize of this year, uh, it actually finishes the sequence. So now the discovery of each of those three viruses is awarded with a Nobel Prize. So why it's so important? Uh, it is so important because of the way our modern medicine works. So if we are like talking about some doctor which uh, encounters the patient and uh, diagnose the disease and all that stuff and finds out that uh, this particular patient uh, for the treatment needs uh, some like pills, some medicine, uh, then this is basically it. Like the doctor interacted with the patient, gave him the tablets, they gave him the, the pills which were produced in a very clean environment in some pharmaceutical company, and the patient gets his treatment. That, that's all. That's all the interaction. But when the same doctor encounters some other patient, which for his or her treatment requires surgery, then this, uh, the situation changes dramatically. Because uh, in general, when this situation occurs, it's not just doctor and the patients. There are a lot of other people, not just medical staff, but other people from the street, basically from the street. And those people, why are they here? Why do we need them? Because after the surgery, many patients require blood transfusions. So uh, donors are the people from the street which come uh, out of some like moral uh, 
ideas, they come, they donate their blood, and this, this blood is used to sustain this patient after the surgery. And if we have some infection, some virus, for example, which affects one of those donors and we can't diagnose it, then in this case, successful surgery, this patient may get toxic blood, infected blood, blood with some infectious agent. And this person can become sick and due to his or her uh, situation, uh, condition after the surgery, which this can re lead to a really grim consequences that people may die out of that. So that's why those two, uh, those three viruses are so important. They uh, three, all three of them were discovered uh, during surgical procedures. Like there were uh, people developing uh, <clears throat> immune deficit or people developing hepatitis after the surgeries, and there were a lot of those people. And after the discoveries, which were made by Nobel laureates of all three of, of those viruses, uh, surgical uh, derived hepatitis or immune deficits, they just stopped. That, that's why those uh, infections got their prices. So let's now talk about all of three of those people and what they have done to like earn this price. And first is Harvey J. Alder. And I call this person, I nickname him uh, the brave. Why is he so brave? Uh, because he was an explorer and he was not just an, any explorer, he was a very brave explorer. And uh, now I'll, I will have to use a metaphor to explain why is that. So imagine a lake, a big lake somewhere far, surrounded by trees or some other grown stuff. And this lake is fed by some rivers which go into it and fill it with water. And imagine that some scientists uh, find uh, golden sand on the bottom of the lake. And you know that if you, if you have some gold in the lake, then it means that some of the rivers which feed this lake bear this sand. And uh, it is a good idea to find that river and start uh, looting this sand, like get taking it out, producing gold. So some adventurer comes to this place and starts searching the lakes rivers, and finally finds the river which bears that gold sand. And he uh, invests money, he takes investors, he like borrows money and so on, and he builds a factory and uh, he starts to produce fortune out of that. And other people come and also start to produce fortune out of this river, which bears that gold sand. What is what in, in this metaphor? The big uh, full, a lake full of water is the uh, all amount of patients which undergone surgery uh, in the field of medicine. And those uh, single do uh, drops of golden sand are cases of post-surgical hepatitis. And the river which bears the golden sand initially, the river which was initially found, is hepatitis B virus. Hepatitis B virus was found, like the, the, it was the first hepatitis B virus to be found to be uh, tra uh, transfusable, to be achieved, to be taken by the patients from uh, donors who donated their blood. So <clears throat> why is Harvey J. Alder is so brave? It's because while everyone was starting the new virus, which was originally um, discovered in 1965, he, although there was less than a decade from this discovery, he started to look for something new because he, he sensed that something is not right in this picture. That in this picture, when he came here, uh, that something was completely wrong here. Uh, so what he did, he basically used basic math. He uh, counted all the amounts of post-surgical hepatitis, and he counted all the amounts of hepatitis B virus cases, and he found out that not any of, uh, not all of the uh, non uh, post-surgical hepatitis cases could be explained by hepatitis B virus. So he found that the, a small fraction, a small fraction of all the hepatitis cases were caused by something else. And this something else, he, he nicknamed non-A, non-B hepatitis. And the cause for it was not known by the time. So basically he found out some other source, feeding this lake with golden sand. 
Uh, <clears throat> the second person here is Michael Hogan, uh, and uh, him I call the, the fisherman. Uh, his discovery was made in 1989, uh, and uh, what he basically did, he found the actual virus. Uh, because uh, after Alter did his experiments, he didn't find the virus it, him, itself. He, it, he was a statistician. He was a uh, uh, his <clears throat> his uh, work was purely mathematical and uh, almost purely mathematical. And uh, Houghton actually found the virus. How did he do that? Uh, at first, we need to understand how the viruses work and how our, our immune systems work. So the virus is a very small particle, much smaller than our cells and much less complex. And it can't survive on its own. It can't uh, feed itself. It, it can't propagate. Uh, it must uh, encounter some cells. In case of uh, hepatitis viruses, uh, it must encounter the uh, cells, cells of the liver. So he gets in this this cell and he basically reprograms it to produce new viruses instead of what this cell usually needs and after the uh, some amount of viruses is produced the cell usually dies and the viruses they get out and spread and infect other cells so uh, in general this is look uh, this look like this so this is a small 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 virus which uh like tied itself to the membrane of the cell and uh, over take control of it, so the cell basically engulfs it and uh, it will release inside. And in several hours or days or months, we can see a picture like this. So the cell is completely enslaved by the virus and uh, all it does is produces new, new and new and new viruses. It's a very uh, dangerous cell for the body. So the structure of the virus is very simple. Uh, it has some kind of genetic material. It can be DNA or RNA, single-stranded or double-stranded. But the main thing is that this uh, information about the structure of the virus is written in the same very language uh, as the information inside the cells themselves. And uh, this uh, genome of the virus is engulfed in, uh, in some layers of protection. So it can be a protein layer or a lipid layer or both and uh, some uh, proteins on the uh, surface of, the, of this virus would be uh, dedicated to control the cell behavior. So uh, basically it's like a flash drive for a computer. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, the very, um, like the, the um, very important thing which uh, Michael Houghton used to find this virus is called an antibody. Is an, an antibody is what our body is produce, uh, producing uh, when it encounters some infection. So uh, uh, it has uh, two regions in its structure. The first region is a constant region, and it's like a, a common region for all the antibodies. And the second region is variable, and it is uh, like produced for uh, against any infection which is encountered. encountered. So when the body in, uh, encounters some new virus, for example, after some time, antibodies are produced to uh, stick with their variable regions to the surface of the virus. So they are uh, randomly uh, constructed in order to construct this variable region to be like an anti-region for some protein on the surface of the virus or bacteria and so on. So the antibody is a very important uh, molecule for our defense. It basically shines for the other immune agents to... Uh, like uh, for them to find the virus and to eat it. So when we have those antibodies, we can, for example, put them on the bottom of the plate and, uh, for example, wash this plate with some uh, like blood or urine or something containing the virus. And after that, this virus will uh, stick to this antibody and we can fish it out. So now what Michael Houghton actually did. Uh, he took uh, and a diseased individual, and he took a, a monkey. Monkey was uh, at first healthy. So yeah, from this diseased individual, he took a drop of blood and infected the monkey with this blood. So the hepatitis is a bloodborne virus. So the, the monkey got an infection. Monkey was diseased after that. What he did after? Uh, after that, he extracted the genetic material from the blood of the monkey. So he sucked the blood, blood out and purified out of it all 
other than genetic material. And as, as far as you can understand, most of the genetic material was responsible for creating the parts of the monkey. But some of the genetic material was from the viruses. And after, after he extracted this genetic material, he basically expressed it. So he made this uh, genetic material work in the controlled environment. And he took all the antibodies he could find in this diseased individual, presuming that some of them are against hepatitis B viruses, but none of them are against monkeys because none, uh, not a single person in the entire universe was ever infected by the monkey. So, uh, and he found that specific antibody which stuck to this expressed genetic material. And that's how he found out, okay, this genetic material I extracted from the monkey and expressed is genetic material from the virus. He read this, he fished it out, he read this, and he found out that this was a viral material from uh, the virus from fa family Flaviviridae. Flaviviride, sorry. Uh, and uh, after that, he was brave enough to state, okay, I found a new virus and I call it here hepatitis C virus. So that was his contribution. And uh, the third person we, we have to talk about is Charles M. Rice. What did this person do? So I call him a super spreader and his uh, discovery was made in 1997. So it was uh, already quite close to ours. And what, basically what he did, he uh, <clears throat> completed the uh, Robert Koch postulates. What are the postulates about? Uh, Robert Koch was one of the famous immunologists uh, back in uh, 19th century. And he uh, found out that in order for us to understand that this particular disease is caused by this particular agent, this agent must fulfill three uh, notions. First, like it, it must be from some unique disease. So we must uh, isolate some unique disease and uh, then we can start finding this agent. Then uh, this organism uh, we are looking for must be present in all the diseased individuals. So it's, it's not present in all of them, then it can't be causative. And the last notion is that this microorganism, when injected in some new body, uh, a healthy body, will cause the same disease as uh, in the diseased individuals it was extracted from. So those are basically the Koch postulates. And uh, out of those postulates, uh, the first basically was produced by Harvey Alter, uh, who found this disease out of all the hepatitis B cases. He isolated non-A, non-B hepatitis. Uh, the second one was uh, found by Michael Houghton, uh, who found this unique microorganism, Flaviviride virus, uh, and give it a name, hepatitis C, and all well, what was left to Charles M. Rice to finish those postulates is to infect someone with this virus and actually cause the disease. So what he, did he do? He tried to do it as, as, uh, as clear as he could. So he took the virus, he took that poor monkey, uh, some other monkey, some healthy monkey, and this virus, he not just uh, injected in the monkey because it would be not as clear as he wanted. Uh, he stripped it of all the layers and basically took out only the genetic material of the virus. And this, this genetic material he very carefully put inside the liver of the monkey, inside the liver cells of the monkey, and he basically saw the, the monkey got disease because this um, genetic material when put in the monkey, uh, it started to reprogram the monkey cells and started to uh, like making them produce new viruses. So after this work, all the three Koch postulates were uh, complete and our three heroes got their Nobel Prize right now. And this, uh, as you can see, the uh, initial work was done in 1972. So it's like 40 or even 50, almost 50 years ago. It's quite a long time which took these um, discoveries to complete, and also quite a long time uh, to Nobel com Committee to finally award those scientists with uh, their prize. So the, the, this basically it. Uh, if you have some question, I can answer them. Yay! Thank you, Max. Okay, we are welcome. Uh, we, we welcome questions right now. 
both in NEET and if you're watching us on YouTube. So, Max, why did you say that this prize was a boring one? Uh, because, like, CRISPR is very fascinating and uh, the uh, black holes are also, uh, they make news. And uh, this one is quite boring because, like, everyone is bored with diseases uh, on one hand, ex except for COVID disease. Uh, and uh, it was, it, it's quite a, a long back discovery. So, uh, the la latest discovery was done in 1997, so everyone really already forgot about uh, this uh, hepatitis C virus because uh, basically what uh, sprang from out from those discoveries is the diagnosis. And so uh, after that was found the HIV diagnostics, the hepatitis B and hepatitis C virus diagnostics, basically no one gets those viruses out from surgery. And doctors are not uh, in despair because of it, and patients are not dying out of it, and the viruses are still there. They're spread on some other means, but they are not like they are not making the news. They are not making the tragedies uh, known to anyone. Like uh, a doctor who conducted a very complex surgery and died out of out of the virus that doctor presented to him after the surgery. Yeah, so they are not, there is not hype, uh, Nobel Prize for sure. And yeah, as Lily says, it's good that people are not dying from it, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Melz is asking, what are the symptoms of hepatitis C? Uh, the symptoms are basically hepatitis. Uh, hepatitis uh, is a Latin word which can spread into two parts. The hepat is uh, standing for the liver and itis is standing for inflammation. So it's uh, liver inflammation, uh, which uh, eventually causes the liver to fail, and uh, out of that we can uh, get like yellow skin, yellow eyes, uh, everything yellow, because uh, basically what liver does, uh, it uh, not only clears the toxins, but also clears the blood from uh, the old uh, hemoglobin, and that old hemoglobin, when produced by the liver, uh, it becomes yellow or even brown. And if it, it's not done by the liver, then uh, that uh, old hemoglobin just flows through the body and uh, it goes to everywhere, to the eyes, to the nails, and so on, and colors them with yellow. Uh, so, uh, like, liver fails, uh, toxins are not removed, uh, and people die from uh, toxic shock or something like this. Hmm. Got it. Thanks. Um, there is another question from Lily. Is the testing or diagnosis uh, still done with the same antibodies Hutton isolate, isolated? Uh, once again. Uh, is the testing or diagnosis still done with the same antibodies that Hutton isolated? Uh, no, uh, he basically didn't isolate the antibodies, uh, like the antibody producing cells because uh, we need to act actually dissect the animal uh, to do that. And if you remember the animal from which he took the antibody, so you don't dissect humans uh, for, the, for the antibodies. Uh, so he found those antibodies, they, are, they highlighted the cell for, for him uh, in, in which was the part of the genetic material extracted from the monkey. And after that, she, she pointed out that this particular genetic material is from the virus. And after that, people started to look for this particular genetic material. They found the whole virus eventually, extracted it, and then you can inject it to the mice, for example, uh, and produce the mouse antibodies and uh, basically, uh, the mouse or donkey or some other animals produce the antibodies for us, which we use in the lab. It's not humans. So, no, those are not the different things. How is diagnostics done right now? How are they testing for hepatitis C? Uh, it's quite, quite easy. So, there are two, two ways to do that. The E way, which uh, is used on a daily basis, is PCR. So uh, we know the sequence of the virus and we can uh, basically PCR it as, as with COVID, as with um, 
<clears throat> as with HIV virus, uh, with uh, almost any virus, the standard of diagnostics is PCR. But if this doesn't work, for example, if uh, the virus is not present in huge quantities uh, in the blood uh, and we can't find uh, its genetic material, we can still find the antibodies. So no person basically have antibodies against hepatitis C virus without uh, introduced hepatitis C. Hmm. Got it. Okay, there is uh, one more interesting question from Yuri. Um, Max, do you think that uh, COVID pandemic somehow um, in, in it happened in those closed rooms? Uh, and uh, like basically, uh, uh, I don't think so because uh, this is a decision not made by uh, like uh, it's not an instantaneous decision and no price very rarely if any uh, time awarded due to some uh, political consequences or some events or something like this. So uh, I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for your opinion and thank you for the great presentation. I think at this point we will stop and invite everyone into our networking hubs. Uh, if you have more questions, to Max or to other speakers of ours, please um, go and ask them. Uh, remember, we have two hubs, which you will find when you scroll a bit down our main hub uh, page. The one is for speakers, uh, speakers lounge. Speakers, please go there and be ready to answer questions. As we already tried before, you can make smaller circles, which each speaker having their own uh, pool of questions, of people asking questions. And there's also 15 by four lounge where you are welcome to join if you want to chat more about 15 by 4 how it's done in different cities, exchange experiences, and I think I will also go there right now. With this, thank you all for joining us tonight. Thank, big, big thanks to our speakers, and see you again on other 15 by 4 events. Bye-bye.